if you're interested. Today, uh, we're going to start with Chef Dolman, who's uh, been a great leader of the Event Horizon Telescope these last many years. He's going to tell us about their tools today. Okay, you guys don't mess around. Hey. <laughs> oh, no, we're on the clock here. I oh, know, we're on the clock. Can you guys hear me? Is this like working? Uh, I'm going to dispense with this. Uh, oh, the mic's on now, so. What? Now it's working. Is it working? Okay, great. Okay, so uh, in the next 12 minutes, I'm going to introduce you to the next generation Event Horizon Telescope project. Uh, the idea is how can we build out the Event Horizon Telescope so that we can do new science, attack new scientific goals that will be as transformative as the first image of a black hole was. There we go. So just to recap a little bit, uh, this is M87. This was the subject and object that we observed to make the first image of a supermassive black hole. And you can see there are jets going off to the upper right here. There's also one going off to the lower left, but it's going away from us, so it's top of de-boosted. And over a factor of about 10,000 or so, you see this self-similar jet, but it's only when you get to one millimeter wavelength which can pierce the hot gas <coughs> accreting onto the black hole with sufficient angular resolution that you can see this telltale signature of a supermassive black hole. And on the right, you see a GRMHD simulation of what we thought we were going to see. And this shows you how that shadow forms. Light from all different directions is lensed around the black hole. Some lightly lensed around and some doing full U-turns around the black hole. So you wind up getting this ring, this photon ring here, with a bunch of extended emission around it. But the size of that ring is directly related to the mass of the supermassive black hole. It's a very simple relationship here, square root of 27. And by measuring this, we could then test Einstein's predictions of strong light lensing around a supermassive object. Now, the way we did this was using VLBI, very long baseline interferometry, probably well known to everyone here. Look directions at all of these baselines at sites around the globe, change as the Earth rotates, Earth rotation aperture synthesis, lets you fill in all of these Fourier spatial frequencies, each telescope pair plucking one Fourier component from the brightness distribution on the sky. You get enough of those, and you can make an image. And the secret sauce here was that we used existing infrastructure all over the globe, levering over a billion dollars, putting bespoke electronic systems at each of these sites to record the data and then transport it to a central correlation facility where we made this data set. All the sites here, I'm not going to go through them, but possibly the most important was ALMA, and a group here and at MIT Haystack led the ALMA phasing project, which combined all 60 of the ALMA dishes into one virtual VLBI element. And this is the, the ultimate Fourier uh, coverage that we had to make our first image. Now, the other bit of secret sauce is that we tied our wagon to commercial off-the-shelf technologies. Instead of designing all the VLBI instrumentation ourselves, we bought them from Amazon, bought them from New Egg, and we were able to track Moore's Law over nearly two decades. So the bandwidth of these systems, directly related to signal-to-noise ratio, increased by two orders of magnitude over this period. This is an example of one of the systems that we installed, this one in Spain. This greatly reduced our time to science by being able to uh, go through the design process in a very speedy way. Now, in 2010, we wrote a decadal review white paper. We said we were going to image an event horizon. We are pretty sure where these sites are going to go. So the timeline here is that our ne next science meeting is here. We're going to go through a series of design reviews. And a full proposal is on deck for September of 2023. I'm happy to answer any questions. Jeff, this is wonderful what you've done uh, and what's ahead. I was on the relevant panel in 2010. So <laughs> 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 I remember you. Given <laughs> <laughs> very clear instructions, do not waste your time thinking about things that cost less than fifty million dollars. <laughs> so you should have asked for sixty million. Uh, <laughs> and I hope in twenty thirty you'll ask for a billion to go to Geosynchronous. Uh, there's a question over here. Um, yeah, this is really exciting, and I look forward to seeing. This. I was just curious, though. Can you say anything about when we might see a picture of Sag A star? No. <laughs> uh, although 
I wish I could. What do you think, Angelo? <laughs> it's like it's like that eight ball, like just like maybe. <laughs> I, 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 we we are we're as excited to see those as you are, possibly even more. Above are allowed to ask questions to you, but may just have to wait. Uh, Dave, can you comment on uh, prospects for seeing that N equals 2 uh, frames? So, yeah. Alex, who's talking about the photon ring telescope, yeah. basically need to go to space? Yeah, it's, it's really interesting. So, we, we think the N equals 1 ring is achievable from the ground. You have to remember that the, the, the angle subtended by all those photons to make a full U turn limits the flux density of that ring. So the n equals zero ring is most of the flux. Only about 10% is left in that n equals one ring. But through the magic of interferometry, if you give a long enough baseline, the n equals zero ring resolves out. You don't even see it anymore. So all you're sensitive to is the n equals one ring. Going, the n equals two ring is yet again smaller and fainter. So you're going to need to go to space to see that, but you would also need a lot of sensitivity. So the n equals 1 could be the sweet spot. n equals 2 will be extremely challenging, uh, even on the long baselines. So for that reason. I mean, you, you, you need like an Alma in space. There's your billion dollars, Douglas. <laughs> Alma in space. Alma in space. I get 10 billion, I mean. Pretty soon you're talking real money. The difficulty goes as the log. It's okay. Yeah, sure. So that Oh. The movie was very dramatic. Um, can you say a little more about what you actually learned from the time series? It wasn't super obvious. Yeah, yeah so it, this, is, this is extremely important. So it, the, the launching of the jet through the Blanford's NIAC process it involves looking at the magnetic field lines as they're circulating and understanding whether they're piercing the horizon or not. So from that standpoint, we want to increase our angular resolution, dynamic range, and look at polarization maps. And then you can see there are spiral structures that flow down the, the jet. And we'd like to track those. And th those also give us a test of the BZ process. And, but more closer to the black hole itself, being able to look at orbital periods, that is a completely different test of Einstein's theory. So for example, the size of the black hole shadow is insensitive to spin. Right? There's a, de there's a degeneracy there. But the period of orbits around the black hole is exquisitely sensitive to spin. So you go from four minutes for a prograde orbit around the black hole to an hour for Sagittarius A star if it's counter-rotating. So th th we can start to cleave degeneracies of spin, inclination, and map out the tomography of orbits around the black hole. And that's a completely different test of GR. And right, right now, we're, we're kind of limited for the n equals 0. So anything we can do is a big advance forward in that, in that topic. like this clicker might be dead, so I'll just use my computer. Uh, nah, I'll just use the arrow keys. That works. Uh, yeah, so hi. Uh, my name is Tyler. I'm, a, as I said, a first year postdoctoral future faculty leader fellow, and I'll talk to you about uh, investigating the spectra of uh, type 1a supernova remnants and what that can tell us about progenitor scenarios. So type 1a supernova are, of course, the explosions of the white dwarfs at the end of their lifetime. And the classical picture is that it's either uh, the origins are single degenerate or double degenerate. Uh, single degenerate here on the right, where you have a uh, red supergiant or maybe main sequence star that is overfilling its Roche lobe, accreting onto the white dwarf. White dwarf reaches the Chandrasekhar limit and explodes. 
Uh, whereas the double degenerate of uh, classical pictures, you have two white dwarfs now, hence the double, and they in spiral over a long time after emitting gravitational waves, uh, or while they're emitting gravitational waves, until they eventually collide together and merge and thus uh, explode then. Uh, but of course, uh, astronomy is much more complicated than these two basic scenarios, and it even seems like using the progenitor uh, using the companion might not be the best way to really understand these. And what we really might want to care about and what have better predictions to nucleosynthesis, energetics, uh, observables, is looking at uh, the mass of the primary and the actual explosion mechanism rather than the companion. And so here is a chart, uh, which uh, most of it is white out for now just for simplicity. Uh, to show you uh, different types of uh, masses and burning processes on the top to two columns, and then different types of uh, mass transfer on the uh, y-axis. And so the top left of this chart right now is showing uh, the classic uh, single generate. You have a near Chandrasekhar mass white dwarf creating material from a star. Uh, the bullet point on the right is actually the, the classic double generate merger via gravitational wave in spiral. Uh, but then there's also this point down here at the bottom left where you have two white dwarfs, so double degenerate, but one white dwarf is accreting onto another, which then that other one goes past the Chandrasekhar limit. So now we have both a Chandrasek near Chandrasekhar mass explosion, but it's also double degenerate, but very single to the single degenerate models. So it might make more sense to actually look at the mass of the primary and the explosion mechanisms. And so also uh, in more recent years, there have been some other uh, theories for uh, causing 1A supernova remnants, uh, 1A supernovae. Uh, specifically, this double detonation method has gained a lot of traction in uh, theory and simulation land, where you have uh, either a helium star or a helium white dwarf accreting onto the primary, which forms a helium layer around the white dwarf, and eventually that gets big enough to ignite, uh, which will then prompt an explosion in the white dwarf and allow it to explode. And particularly, this seems very good at exploding sub Chandrasekhar mass white dwarfs. Uh, and there's a variant of this, the uh, D6 method, the dynamically driven double degenerate double detonation method, where instead of the helium layer exploding as it gets too large and too hot, uh, it actually is ignited by dynamical instabilities, hence the first two Ds. Uh, and this can allow for uh, thinner layers of helium, and this can actually happen before, uh, earlier on in the process of the white dwarfs orbiting each other, which can potentially lead to an explosion of the primary, while the secondary is far enough away to not be merged, to not be consumed, and you can be left with a companion. Uh, and then finally, there are even more models here, which I'm not going to get too detailed into. You have white dwarfs that can directly collide instead of in-spiraling. You can have a white dwarf black hole system, and tidal disruptions can induce an explosion. And you can also uh, have oxygen neon white dwarf primary. Uh, everything I've talked about so far has been carbon oxygen white dwarfs. Uh, oxygen neon, there's some problems with uh, theoretically getting them to explode instead of just turning to neutron stars. But potentially there might be some method uh, which can allow these explosions. And so this is kind of a general overview of, of 1A uh, supernova explosion mechanisms. And of course, we as astronomers want to understand more about these violent events, understand how they happen, understand which is a primary method or if there's multiple equally likely methods of explosions to understand these uh, events role in galactic evolution and uh, formation of new stars at higher metallicities. And so one way to understand more about these explosions is to look at supernova remnants. Uh, so here is Tycho's supernova remnant, and uh, these are, supernova remnants expand for tens of thousands of years after the initial explosion, surrounding into the ambient medium. And we can look at these to uh, study them and gain more information about the progenitors. Uh, very just off the bat, if you find a surviving companion near or inside of a supernova remnant, that's a smoking gun evidence of the uh, progenitor scenario. No, but then you can also investigate more properties of the supernova remnant itself, looking at its synthesized metals, looking at its shape, looking at the plasma temperatures and densities, and all of these can be combined and uh, analyzed to then uh, be compared to the predictions of models. And so here, the colors in Tycho supernova uh, represent different wavelengths of emission, which correspond to both different element emission lines 
and also whether those emission lines are red shifted or blue shifted. So you can get, uh, by looking at the spectra of these energetic objects, you can get uh, measurements of the total mass of different elements and also more 3D nature on their velocities, again, which can be tied back to uh, simulations and predictions. And so the rest of this talk is going to be focused on analyzing the spectra of supernova remnants. Uh, here are just three sample spectra from uh, Kepler's uh, Tycho supernova remnants and supernova remnant number, number, number. Uh, and uh, these are characterized by a broad continuum emission, which gives you the overall shape of the spectra in the X-rays, uh, both from thermal bremschlung, from the millions of degrees ejecta, which are heated by the reverse shock, plowing through the uh, material emitted by the supernova, and also synchrotron emission, uh, non-thermal emission, uh, mainly from the forward shock as it plows outward into the uh, interstellar medium. But importantly, on top of the broad uh, profile of these spectra, you also get emission lines uh, from different elements. So here labeled are emission lines, silicon, sulfur, argon, calcium, iron are some of the biggest. And by looking at these emission lines and measuring them, you can measure the amount of material in the uh, remnant itself, which can then, the, uh, particularly the mass ratios of different elements, can be compared to uh, 1A simulations. Uh, because many of the different progenitor methods, many of the different explosion mechanisms, can have vastly different predictions for uh, some of these elements, uh, which I'll talk a little bit more about on the next slide. Uh, and so this is just a, a zoom in of a very important region in supernova uh, remnant spectra, the iron group region, so chromium, manganese, iron, and nickel. If you look at these elements in particular, there's um, and measure their masses and their different ratios, these can probe things such as the central density of the progenitor uh, primary white dwarf, uh, its mass, uh, how many uh, uh, the neutron excess, which correlates with uh, how metal, uh, the metallicity of the progenitor, and just all these different properties which can then again be fed into simulations or compared to simulations and help us understand more about how and why these uh, explosions occur and like what frequency different types occur. And so uh, one in particular is the manganese to iron ratio. So here I'm showing a plot of uh, all the data points are observed manganese to iron compared to iron on H of various uh, stars, just measuring the metallicities. Uh, and the tracks, uh, the red track corresponds to with only near Chandrasekhar mass explosions occurred. So only the either single degenerate or, uh, or uh, accretion to near Chandrasekhar mass explosions from another white dwarf. And the blue track is if only sub Chandrasekhar mass explosions occurred. And so because these two different types of explosions have such different central densities, they have such different nucleosynthesis, and so you produced uh, incredibly different amounts of manganese to iron, especially at uh, later times when we get to uh, zero, zero, which is you know, our sun and stars around that area. And so what this data shows us is that then there must be a mix of near Chandrasekhar mass and sub Chandrasekhar mass explosions uh, that both progenitor scenarios are necessary. And so this is just one way of, of, of quantifying and placing limits on the different types of uh, explosions. And so there's also, a, instead of comparing to stars, you compare to supernova remnants directly. Again, as I mentioned, measuring the mass ratios of supernova remnants by using their spectra. Uh, so here, the uh, top plot is showing near Chandrasekhar mass simulations. The bottom is showing uh, sub Chandrasekhar mass simulations. And you don't really need to take a, a, a specific conclusion from this, but it's just showing you an example spread of the different uh, amounts of synthesized metals for different uh, progenitors, for different metallicities. The colors correspond to different metallicities, and the color seems to very much affect the calcium to sulfur produced masses. Whereas, for example, the different types of explosions, the different uh, white dwarf masses and critical densities seem to have more effect along the y-axis affecting uh, chromium to iron. So if you can get measures of all of these different elements, silicon, sulfur, argon, calcium, nickel, chromium, iron, manganese, then you can uh, put those data points into these plots uh, and, and get a handle on... Uh, what is the progenitor for that supernova remnant in question? And if you have a larger sample of supernova remnants, then you can get a more handle on the, the 
uh, frequency and likelihood of different uh, explosions and constraints on the different types of uh, simulations. And so now to get more into my work, uh, so right now I am doing a global analysis, a full comprehensive analysis uh, studying Kepler's supernova remnant uh, using Suzaku spectra because it has pretty good spectral resolution, able to really get down to those uh, ion group lines which are very faint uh, down on the bottom right of the plot. And uh, my goal is to fit the global spectra to this entire supernova remnant and pull out all the mass information of elements that I can. And if you were paying particular attention to the previous plot, you might have seen that there are data points here. There's a data point actually for Kepler for these. Uh, this is not mine, this is from a previous paper. So you might ask, Tyler, why are you doing this again if it's already been done? And so the point of my work now is to really do a comprehensive analysis. Uh, different people have done different levels of analysis on Kepler, but there hasn't really been a full global analysis of the entire spectra all at once that includes all of these elements. Uh, like Katsuda in 2015, they did the whole supernova remnant, the full X-ray band pass, 0.5 to 8 keV, but uh, didn't include the chromium, manganese, and nickel lines, so you can't get that uh, very important information. Uh, Martinez Rodriguez et al. in 2017, uh, they did uh, the entire supernova remnant, analyzed all the elements, including chromium and manganese, but they split their analysis into two regions, analyzing the 2 to 5 keV with one model, and the 5 to 8 keV emission with another model. So that splits the intermediate mass silicon to argon and uh, iron group elements, and you can't really compare them to. So you can't get like a silicon to iron ratio with their method. Uh, and uh, Sato et al. in 2020 uh, uh, has done analysis on just the specific iron-rich structure uh, in Kepler's supernova remnant, but of course that's not the entire remnant, and so you can't get total masses and total mass ratios for the entire object. Uh, so that is what I am doing here using uh, fitting the entire spectra. It gets pretty complicated with many different models, and so one important thing that I'm trying to do is not only get mass ratios, uh, is to also test how robust Woodley's type of global uh, comprehensive fits be. Like how if, uh, if I can find this fit, which has a pretty good, uh, it's pretty good reduced chi-squared, I can also find other fits which have equally good reduced chi-squareds and see what like the differences between those fits are and how much like a local minimum really affects our data, which will tell us how much you can trust any given uh, mass ratio produced by this analysis. Don't have much time, but so just this is a plot uh, showing calcium to sulfur, uh, versus the ejector component temperature. Very preliminary. The error bars are too large. I'm lowering them as we speak via doing the analysis a bit more correctly. But very preliminary, you can see depending on the temperature that of the local minimum that the fit finds, you can get a different calcium to sulfur ratio. And so that's one thing that I'm investigating. And so I'll just leave you with a slide. Uh, once I get this done with Kepler, uh, then this can be applied to many supernova remnants to get a handle on the population and uh, then compare that to 1A simulations. Thank you. Thank you, Tyler. Um, we have time for a question or two. So you talk a lot about element ratios, but and the answer to this could be that you would just need an unrealistic amount of telescope time. Mm -hmm. but uh, are the data and the models good enough here that you could say something about the absolute number of nuclei of different species that are in one of these remnants? Uh, no, there is not. So one problem when doing fitting is that it's easy to get ratios between different elements, but if you want a total mass of an element in the remnant or you know total number of particles, uh, everything here is assuming a certain volume filling factor. Uh, so does, is the medium, is the material evenly spread across the entire remnant? Is it a very dense region that is just in one part of the remnant? Uh, you can't really know that information, and so you have to make a guess on the volume filling factor, uh, which then this cancels out if you're doing ratios, uh, so that's why I'm doing it like that. But for total masses, you have to, you know, compare it to say, okay, well, I know that there should be a total one solar mass of ejecta, total, and so then you can constrain it that way, but it's all still uncertain. Good question. Yeah. Maybe one more question while uh, William sets up his computer. Yeah. 
there are all those subtypes of 1As, like superluminous, underluminous, and so on. How do they fit all this landscape? Like, can can there be the case that, for instance, one particular SNR, uh, the illumina, came from a, uh, SN1A, a subtype that has a different physical origin, and then you have different uh, physical reasons to have uh, different abundance? Um, I'm sorry, can you, can you repeat yeah, sure. the question? You have subtypes of SN1A, and there's, it's still kind of unclear where those come from, like super, super luminous, under luminous, and so on. For some of them, the situation is clear, for some of them not. So can it be the reason, your sample is pretty small, yes. that you would, because of these variants, you would pick up a particular supernova remnant, because you don't know whether the given supernova 1A was under luminous or super luminous, and you might get the weird chemical abundances which would actually reflect the physical origin but rather than the operations. Uh, yes, yes, that's, uh, that's a good question. And uh, yes, you could definitely, especially because of the limited sample, uh, get that effect where you're picking up on, on uh, just the variations inherent in the explosion versus the different types. Um, so the, the eventual goal is to build on that sample and get as many as possible, which then you'll be able to see trends uh, and see what parameter space the supernormants fall upon. Uh, but yes, that is that is still uncertainty here, and uh, it's being worked on. Okay, let's thank Tyler again. <laughs> Next on the agenda, we have Julian Munoz, who's a Clay Fellow on the ICC corridor. So he's going to tell us about small-scale structure with Hubble. Thanks, Dad. And thanks for the pronunciation. That's very cute. I appreciate it. It was very close, yes. <laughs> you can also just call me Julian. That, that works. Uh, so yeah, I'm a Clay Fellow here. Uh, I'm going to tell you about some of the things I'm interested in and I've been working on recently on trying to measure the muscular structure of dark matter using data from the HST. And I want to preface this by saying this work has been led by a grad student Nash Shapti at King's College, who now is moving to Hopkins as a postdoc. Uh, so you know, keep an eye for him, his career. Uh, and he's in these two papers. So the guiding question on, on this part of my research is what do we know about structure formation? And it turns out a fair amount, but not as much as we would like. And this 2D plot kind of gives you an idea. So here is the scales of fluctuation in the universe we have probed versus cosmic time. And if you're a cosmology aficionado, you might be used to redshifts and halo masses. And here you can see how different probes have been able to map this. Uh, so at, at um, early times, large scales, we have data from the CMB. It's actually very precise. Uh, later on, we have data from the Alaska structure, includes galaxy surveys, Lyman Alpha Forest, weak lensing, different maps near us. And then even closer to us, you get the Milky Way, uh, where you get some information, but it's harder to disentangle, and it's only very close to us. And the gap, the obvious gap here in our knowledge is what's happening at small scales in early times. Uh, and here in this region, at about 100 million years to a billion years of the Big Bang, is where the first galaxies will form. And they will form in small mass halos. So this is the part that we would like to understand better. And if you're a dark matter aficionado, like I am, it is also where you would expect the first deviations from the standard cold dark matter paradigm to appear. So there's reasons from astrophysics and sort of particle physics and cosmology to care about this region. I'm going to tell you how the Hubble Space Telescope gives us a way to probe a little bit what's happening here by using the UV luminosity functions. So the idea here is that the Hubble Space Telescope measures light in the infrared and in the visible, that was emitted at high redshifts by galaxies in the UV, stress frame UV. And you might have seen pictures like this of the Hubble Deep Field, where some of these points far away are actually galaxies at high redshifts. And these are beautiful pictures, but until I started working on this, I didn't realize it's also very strong scientific input, because from these galaxies, you can count them. And there's enough of them. You can build luminosity functions. Like this is, on the y-axis, how many galaxies there are. On the x-axis, their magnitude or brightness. And the latest compilation has about 10 to the 4 galaxies, so a non-significant amount. And you see, the, the luminosity functions cover ratio 4 to 8, so during the epoch organization. So astrophysically, it's very interesting. And if you haven't encountered plots like this before, just to guide your eye a little bit, uh, things to the left here are brighter galaxies, so they live in bigger halos. Uh, and they start to be less abundant, so that's where the curves go down. So this seems to sort of you know, match our understanding of, of how these galaxies form and, and evolve. Um, but what I'm going to tell you also is how this allows us to learn cosmology. 
And the idea is that the halos here in this plot cover from 10 to the 10 to 10 to the 12 solar masses, roughly. And the Milky Way lives in a 10 to the 12, roughly. So these are not, you know, rare halos today, but they were when these galaxies formed. So redshift 6 and redshift 8 structure formation was not as both as it is today. So these halos are a several sigma deviation from the average, so they're very sensitive to the amplitude of the power spectrum. In a way, it's like doing cluster cosmology, but a high redshift instead of today. And we'll be able to translate this into measurements for cosmology. So the way we model this is very, very simple. As we say, the data we see is a luminosity function, is number of galaxies per unit magnitude, or unit luminosity in the UV, is a product of two components, how many halos there are, the halo mass function, times how bright each of the halos is, so how bright is the galaxy inside it. It's the halo galaxy connection. And one of them is purely cosmology, the other one is purely astrophysics. And the question you can ask then is, can we separate the cosmology from the astrophysics? And of course, because I'm telling you about this, the answer is yes, um, but it's not trivial, and it actually, these things are very degenerate. Um, but I'm gonna tell you the model that we use to separate this, and it's very simple. And the model, you have to connect a halo, which is a dark matter object with some mass, to some amount of UV photons, some luminosity. Uh, for this, you take two assumptions. The first, very reasonable, UV light comes from young stars. And that is because young stars, OV B type, tend to be hotter, so you can emit in the UV. So lumino the UV luminosity is proportional to the star formation rate with some things we can calibrate. So then the question is how you connect halo mass to star formation rate. And here's the second assumption, which is a little shakier, which is this relation between the halo mass and the star formation rate is a parametric function of the accretion rate. So to go from a halo mass to a UV luminosity, you have some halo, this halo is accreting gas. Some of these gas converts into stars through a function that I'll talk about. And then these stars that are formed emit UV. And this is a big if. Uh, it could be that the galaxy that lives in each halo is entirely uncorrelated with the accretion rate or the mass of the halo. Uh, simulations seem to tell us that this is actually the case. This is fine. Uh, but it is something that we have to confirm with better data and you know, with more simulations. But what we did for this F star, this is going to be something we have to marginalize over. We want to know how many halos there are in the universe of this M halo. So rather than take any one model, there's, um, for this function, there's a plethora of different models. This is, uh, to give you an idea, the star to halo mass ratio. So M star over M halo divided by M halo. And all these are different uh, results. And I see they all disagree, but also kind of agree in the main features, which is this thing peaks at about 10 to the 12 solar masses, Milky Way sized again. Uh, it's smaller at high masses because you're feedback limited by AGNs, we, we expect. And at low masses, you're limited by other sources of feedback because your halos become shallower, the potential shallower is easier to expel gas. So you get like supernova, reionization, stellar winds that make it, uh, make this have a power law-like behavior. So rather than take any one of these, uh, we just take a simple heuristic model with four parameters, some amplitude, some location for this peak, and two power law indices on both sides, and we'll marginalize over all of these parameters. And how well you can measure these parameters is a question of astrophysics. If you marginalize over them, you can try to get to measure the under, underlying halo mass function. Um, so what Nash Safti, a student, did very, very well is he wrote a public code called Galumi that can run all these models in like 10 milliseconds through a public uh, Boltzmann code like class. And th there's one model, the bl blue arrow that I've described to you. There's all the two other models you can compare. And the reason you want to do this in milliseconds is because you want to run an MCMC. You want to be able to properly marginalize over things to get parameters at the end, cosmological parameters. Um, I want to emphasize that we include scattering the halo galaxy connection and dust, which are the two big hard assumptions here. And if you're interested in this, please, let's chat. These are hard things. And it talks to all the cosmic things like Monty Python and public. So this is part of our cosmic repertoire now. Uh, this is how the things vary with parameters. These are a lot of plots, so don't pay a lot of attention to them. Just like there's some cosmic parameters on the top, some astro parameters on the bottom. But I'm going to focus on one of each. Uh, sigma 8 is the amplitude of fluctuations, the cosmology parameter. And when you move it up and down, the, this is how the curve moves. Uh, here's epsilon star is the star formation efficiency. So how bright is each galaxy? And it moves the curve in a different way. This, the way the curve moves, the way the luminosity function moves, is similar but not identical. And this allows us to distinguish the two. Uh, but to give you a heuristic idea why that is the case, sigma 8, cosmological parameter, 
makes us have more or less galaxies because there's more or less halos. Whereas star formation efficiency makes each galaxy brighter or dimmer. It doesn't destroy or create halos, it just makes them dimmer or um, brighter. So we can distinguish them. And after doing all of this, marginalization and everything, uh, we can get a measurement of sigma 8. And this is what it looks like. Uh, if you haven't uh, thought about this parameter before, this is the amplitude of fluctuation, should be around 0.7 in our standard model. So we get about a 15% error bar measurement. And this pales in comparison with the 1% you get from the CMB, but it's independent of the CMB. We have not used any CMB information here at all. Uh, and what this means is you can compare with measurements of the CMB, measurements from the Lasker structure, which are in disagreement with each other. So this is the sigma 8 again, now plotted against the abundance of matter in our universe, omega matter. This is a traditional way to plot these things, because the Lasker structure, which is the red and the green, are in tension with the CMB that is the yellow. It is about a two-ish sigma tension, depending on which data sets you combine and how. Uh, our error bar, of course, is the blue is much bigger, but it's independent of them. And this with the Hubble Space Telescope data is not designed to do this. Um, of course, if the data gets better, you'll be able to shrink these error bars and really get better precision on sigma 8. But this is not uh, the start of the show. The, the main thing that you can get from this is that you're probing smaller galaxies that you can probe today. And so the sigma A, essentially, in this plot that I showed you before, is the amplitude of fluctuations on very large scale, so above 8 megaparsec moving, roughly. But we don't know what's happening here. And these are the halos that are actually observed by the Hubble Space Telescope, 10 to the 10, 10 to the 12 solar masses. Uh, so what we did is we split the whole power spectrum, so this but in Fourier space, in four different bins with four different amplitudes that we vary. So each of these colors is one of them. And we vary all of them, we vary the cosmological parameters, astrophysical parameters, and here we did add data from Planck, because Planck, the CMB, can only measure the sigma 8. Planck doesn't know anything about what happens below. And we were able to show is that you can measure this steel region to a 15% precision. Specifically, you measure two of these bins uh, to a 15% precision. And 15%, again, kind of compete with the 1% in the CMB, but it's probing a region that we haven't probed so far. So it's really telling us how the first structures form at redshifts 8 or 10 um, and the smaller scales that we currently have access to. And just um, to tell you a little more, to conclude, to tell you what the future looks like for this, of course, it is Hubble. We're going to have James Webb. Uh, data is going to be much better. And on the theory side, where I live, uh, there's two questions that I think are very interesting. The first is, can we add anything from clustering, where the idea is there's telescopes that actually measure the clustering of these galaxies. Uh, only for the brightest ones, but the clustering tells you the bias, and the bias tells you the mass. So you get an independent measurement uh, of the mass. And you can also try to com combine with line intensity mapping measurements, which also depend on the star formation rate. Uh, this is one of the star formation rate plots. Uh, it's in um, a different type of observable, so learning how to combine them would actually allow us to unlock the astrophysics from the cosmology. Uh, but yes, the final slide I want to show is that if you're interested in cosmic dawn, reionization, first galaxies, I've talked about Hubble, 21 centimeter will allow us to unlock even earlier times, smaller scales, uh, and I'll talk about this in my clay lecture on May 12th. So if you're interested in reionization, cosmic dawn, please come to that. Thanks. like it needs to be about three or five times smaller to yeah. really weigh in on the difference between C and D. So um, is that going to happen with James Webb data, or, or kind of what's next? What are the prospects for shrinking that small? That's a, that's a good question. I don't think it's going to shrink by a factor of three or four, maybe a factor of two-ish. The big thing that you will learn is not only you will measure UV luminosities, which gives you star formation rate, you might be able to do what we do with Spitzer, which is measure stellar masses directly. So you get a different handle on the masses of the halos, not just M star formation rate, also M star. And how that factors in is very nonlinear. Uh, and I, I don't have an answer for how well, but I imagine that is not just a factor of two. That is like ellipses go one way, ellipses go other, a different way. And, yeah. Great. Um, other questions? Yes. Uh, very interesting result. I looked at one of the questions, maybe I missed that. Which measurements did you use? And to me, you did like longer measurements. Yeah. yeah, so I used the data that goes ratio 4 to 10 just from the last balance uh, data compilation. In principle, you could go to lower redshifts. 
Uh, higher redshift, we don't have enough galaxies. I mean, you could do frontier fields. So these are legacy fields, meaning just blank point. Frontier fields are the ones that use the cluster. Uh, and then there's systematics with whether the cluster lens is magnifying the same way and you understand it. Uh, James will be able to do a little higher redshift, I expect. Uh, you could do lower redshift, but the problem is the astrophysics is more complicated, and dust in particular gets most complicated. And you start losing a lot of the bright galaxies to dust, which it's harder to discriminate from a legitimate effect in cosmology. So this is sort of like the, the range where I trust. And also, if you want to go to the, to the right, to lower redshift, you know, there's other probes here. There's Laman Alpha Forest, there's Galaxy Surveys. So pushing to higher redshift is the thing that is most interesting. So I've been thinking about sigma 8. It is, it is, of course, defined at redshift 0. And so to say that that can actually be determined by the CMB uh, requires a lot of assumptions. And I'm wondering if maybe we should be a little bit more sophisticated about uh, what we, how we measure uh, structure and uh, have, a, have a different variable. I agree, and, and this is why I folded this into two axes, because uh, main CMB, of course, lives up here. CMB lensing is, is part of this, right? And CMB lensing does have a measurement of sigma 8. Um, I agree, sigma 8, the final redshift 0, depends on what ingredients you add beyond lambda CDM. And, and you can imagine shifting neutrino masses, for example, right? If neutrinos become non-relativistic at redshift 20, as they should, they're going to act differently at redshift 0 than at redshift 1,000. Um, so I, I agree with that, that we, we should, folding it into D seems the, the way to go. But there's a tension in the clustering of matter in this 2D plot. Then I guess sigma is one way of referring to it. Um, if I understood the model correctly, you start with halos, then you go to halo accretion rates, mm -hmm. then you parameterize the relation between halo accretion and star formation rates, and then yeah. separate parameters to velocities or right. function or, or variable. Yes. So why not just cut up the middleman and just have a relation between halos and maybe velocity that has some parameterized form? Good. Like we, we do have one of those, actually. So one of the, the model in green, I don't know if I have a backup slide for that. Uh, we took the data from Mauro Stefanon, who is a Spitzer, uh, to go uh, from stellar masses directly to the UV luminosity, because he targeted with Spitzer, the same galaxies they measured with Hubble. So then he had a, a, but the problem with that is it's less simulation based and more heuristic based on data, which maybe is a plus, uh, but to me it's a minus because I don't understand where it comes from. But yeah, you could go straight from M halo to MUV or LUV with a power law, I, I agree. Uh, I would be a hard time understanding where that's coming from. But if the data suggested that's the case, I'm, I'm okay with that. Okay. Well, if there are no further questions, let's thank William again. <laughs>